Hey, everybody. We are live with my good friend, Jorge Capistani, uh, just such an elite coach. Um, I'm really excited to have him on to talk about uh, the mental game and how you can you know, uh, improve your mental game toughness. Um, I think a lot of you have been introduced to Jorge and his great material already. Um, but I mean, one thing that sticks out to me, Jorge, is that you were the national pro of the year for both the USBTA and PTR, which is, I don't think anyone's ever done that. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. Wow, so you. yeah, sure. So how have you been, Jorge? Good, man. I'm uh, having fun. I'm watching some of the content in, on Tennis Summit and putting nice. out some of the content, but it's great. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And yeah, I really enjoyed your um, the awesome video and like demonstrations on all the cool doubles pressure drills and, and again like yeah. i'm just so excited to do it with and use the sheet um because you know it's it's something where you only need one partner and then you can yeah. like, train your doubles game so that's that's so cool um, yeah that thing really works i've had some uh, super elite players uh use that workout we use it still today um i teach people and then i give them the homework so that when they go out their practice is purposeful and it's just you know, you know how it can be. Sometimes you go out, you know, well, let's just hit, and next thing you know, mm -hmm. let's keep score. I'm losing, let's not, and then you really, you know, didn't get the the proper touches on the ball to make it effective. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. Um, so definitely, everybody, yeah, check that out, especially if the All Access Pass. It's a great, um, great uh, session, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, but yeah, uh, Jorge, uh, I guess I'll just let you take free reign and ask you some questions. But I'm really excited to. Uh, Get into this yeah. mental game, mental toughness session. Okay, cool. So I'm going to share a PowerPoint here in a minute. Um, but first, let me just tell you the premise. Um, obviously, tennis is very mental. And depending on who you talk to, uh, some people feel like, okay, my mental part of my game is okay. Uh, some people think it's a big weakness. Some people think it's their strength. But if you really ask a lot of people, which I have, most think that it's not their strengths. Um, and what I hope to show today is that, you know, I have a whole video course. It's like 60, over 60 videos on mental toughness. But what I wanted to do in like a half hour's time, 30 minutes time is show you if I only had you for a weekend and I was going to teach you just five, just the five of, of the 60, what would I say are the five most important that are actionable? And that's kind of how I laid out this presentation. So, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, let me first get my PowerPoint behaving and see sure. if I can, uh, okay. Now what I need to do is, no, I think this is pretty good. So now I just got to shrink it. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to try to share my screen, buddy. You let me know if, uh, sure. if I did it or if I messed it up. So I'm going to share this in particular. Sure you got it that one okay hey audrey midwest representing here from minnesota Ooh, let's go very cool yeah it looks like a nice beer there i think <laughs> yeah. if you want one i think so okay and um, you should see something on the screen roughly that says 78 hey brian uh yes yes okay cool yes, so perfect um i want to just have people uh, if, if you don't mind what the 78 percent like what do you guys think it's tennis related, but what do you think that is? Uh, we'll just take a second or two. I'd like to see some comments of, you know, is it is it seventy percent first serve? Is that like what the best player? What do you think seventy eight percent? I would give you a tip. We're talking about mental toughness here today, so um, it has a little bit to do with that. And this is how I like I like to talk to people about mental toughness. Uh, you know, even when we're together. Um, so. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna spill the beans a little bit mm, and, gotta guess, and right? uh, tell you what it is. So seven, yes, well, it's close. Seven a percent of the game that's mental. It's uh, it's kind of close. What it is is seventy eight percent of the time of an actual match is downtime. So it's the it's the time between the points, not the time where the ball is going back and forth. Okay. So it's really close to 80%. Uh, so what is, why is that what I start with? Uh, because I think we all agree that when it comes to mental toughness and viewing mental toughness or 
watching a match and seeing mental toughness, it's really hard to to see it during the point. Like if Mayor Bond and I are playing and we're running all over the place trying to chase down balls in the middle of our strides, you don't really say, oh, look at the mental toughness. But as soon as that point ends and we got 20 seconds between points roughly, then you can really see it visually. Sometimes you can see it when it's 10 courts away and you see just the way the person reacts or their, how they walk, whether they throw their arms back, whether they're hunt, you know. So the fact that when you play a two-hour tennis match, 78% is downtime, should all be evidence that maybe I should try to work on those downtime areas because there's so much of it. So I'm going to keep going through the PowerPoint here and see if I can get this cooking. So today we're going to talk about five ways to get mentally tougher. <clears throat> Of, of the many ways, this is the five. So one one thing we're going to talk about is training your inner voice, that little thought that goes in your head that's always in there, that conversation going on. Then I'm going to show you some ways that you can practice under pressure and why you would even want to do that. Uh, then we're going to talk about the between point skills. What should it be happening there? This has been studied a lot, and most coach, or most rec players don't even know about it or how do I do it. Uh, the fourth thing we'll do is we'll take an audit. Uh, and then we're going to develop a plan. And I'll show you how I think you can grab a hold of your game and say, okay, enough of this floundering around year after year. What do I do? i got to get organized. If you had a real professional coach from the tour taking control of your game, how would they lay out your next year? All right, so <clears throat> that's what we're going to do. And then the first one of those is training your inner voice. So here we go. Um, I, I, I have a story to tell. I, I've told this story hundreds of times. I'm not proud of it, but it's a true story. And it, it was an epiphany for me when it happened. I'm 19 years old, Mayor Vaughn. I'm playing in a college team. Uh, we're having a practice, and it's near the end of the practice. And our coach, like the last 45 minutes, had us all play sets, okay, single sets. So there was eight guys who were playing singles on four courts. And uh, my coach was just roaming around between the courts, kind of giving tips, you know, letting the match play out. And I'm playing this guy named Lee who's a little better than me. Plus, he I hate the way he plays. He's just first strike. I can't ever get anything going. Um, I might be him one time out of 10. You know, it's possible, but I usually lose to this guy. But I like the guy. We're playing, and everything's going good. Well, on this particular day, um, my inner voice, I, I get down like one four, two five, and my inner voice starts to get negative. You know, so internally, after every error, I'm kind of inside. I go, come on, Jorge, jeez. What a choker, man. You're freaking forehands. That, you know, just starting to beat up on myself a bit. Um, and then I lose that set. And then I'm down a break in the second. Now I'm getting more agitated. My inner voice is even more negative. And now my inner voice is becoming my outer voice, meaning I'm saying these things out loud. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, come on, you suck. You know, what a joke. Move your feet, you cow. I'm just like full on ragging on myself. And, um, <laughs> which obviously, you know, isn't helping me play better. But um, my coach is a very stoic guy. And near the end, so here's what happened. As he walked around the corner, of my corner, I was on the last court. Um, you know, he just walking like this, real quiet. My coach is kind of, you know, he wasn't a real crazy guy. And he leans in as he walks by and he goes, move your feet, you're a cow. And then he just kept walking. <laughs> and I literally took like, a, like what? What the heck was that? No way. The coach is in. just freaked me out, right? So I keep playing. I'm thinking, what? Uh, did I hear him right? Did the, did the coach just say that to me? <laughs> Whatever. And then he comes around, maybe five minutes later, he comes around my corner again. And he goes, you're such a choker. My God. And then he walks, you know. And now this time I know Whoa. for sure. Wait a minute. What the hell? Uh, I, he just, what? You know, and then he got me one more time. And I was freaking out, like, what is happening here? So here's how the practice ends. We get all together. He makes some announcements. And um, at the, his last thing is he looks to me, and there's eight of us there and standing around. He goes, Jorge, how did you like those things that I said to you? And, of course, I'm 19, so my answer was, oh, yeah. I never have a good answer. I was embarrassed. Uh, and he goes, well, I'll just let you know that all those things I said to you were things that you had already said to yourself. Mm. And as soon as he said that, hand on the Bible, 
I said, I did not say those things. I, and I meant it. I really didn't think I said it. And as soon as I said that, like all my other teammates were like, yes, you did. You said that. You said Kyle. You said and so I was like uh, taken aback, like, what? Really? Did I really say all that? And the, th- the fact is, I'm sure I did. But the point is, I was so unaware of how negative my inner voice had become that even when other people were hearing it, I would have probably that evening, if you would have said, hey, did you talk to yourself good today in that match? I would have said, yeah, no problem. But I was unaware. Okay, so I tell that story, not that I'm proud of it, but because I think it's really easy to slide that way. Some of us that play tennis and are here on the call today, <clears throat> some of us are super um, nervous people. Some of us are kind of quick to anger. Some of us compete well. Um, but this is nothing, you know, that I did naturally well. I had to train for it. So that was my college story. Um, so then that started me on a journey of like, how do I get better at this? And it comes to mental toughness, one of the difficulties, Mirabon, is there's not a lot. It's not as easy to go take a mental toughness lesson. Like every pro in the world, here's a lesson on your serve. I'll fix your backhand. I'll fix this. I'll give you some strategy. I'll teach you some footwork. But like mental toughness, a lot of coaches don't even know what to do. And as so someone who at that age, I was, you know, 19, 20, I kind of knew I was a pretty good player. But I kind of knew, you know, this is not a strength of mine. And I probably got to get better. I just literally didn't even know. So then I came across a book that's very famous. Most of you will have heard of it called The Inner Game of Tennis. And The Inner Game of Tennis is literally still uh, an important book. People outside of tennis, Tom Brady, you know, Tiger Woods, they all talk about this book, Inner Game of Tennis. And now they made an inner game of golf. It's by an author named Tim Galloway. So tip number one, if you've never heard of that, check out the inner game of tennis. And what I took, I took a lot of ideas from that book. But the thing that was kind of helpful to me is when I was being mad and I'm kind of yelling at myself, obviously I didn't enjoy that. I didn't know why I was doing it. If someone just came up to me and said, I have a tip for you, don't do it. That would have been useless because I'm like, what, you think I wake up in the morning wanting to go yell at myself? So what this book described is with this inner argument we have and how weird it is. How can it even be that there is an argument? It's only one person. So when Jorge misses a backhand, it goes, oh, my God, your backhand's a joke. My God, what a loser. You know, who is that? Is that my backhand talking to my forehand? Is that my, my right hand talking to my left foot? And the way he describes it is there's two cells in our body. Self one is the body. That's our body that's running all over, trying to do the job. And then self two is the brain or the mind that just kind of goes along for the ride and tends to be super judgmental. So you work hard, you sweat your butt off, you run over there, you hit a backhand to the best you you can, and you miss it. And then immediately the mind goes, well, I knew it. Your backhand's a joke. You did it in practice all day. This is what's wrong with you. You're a smuck. You know, so he describes it as the mind and the body. So I said, okay, that makes sense at least, uh, you know, to help me understand why this inner argument is happening. But the the cool part is the book kind of convinces you that if your job as a tennis player, especially if you struggle with this, is if you can get your mind to just be quiet, like, dude, just chill out, okay? Think of your mind as a spectator on the side, okay, on, on the side fence watching you play. And if that spectator was saying things to you, like, your forehand's a joke. Oh, my God, you're a loser. What a schmuck, you know, all that stuff. You'd probably want to punch the person, right? So that's a good way to know if you're, you know, off track here. But think about it that way. And then um, the other thing it talked about where my thoughts reside, and I I never thought about this, so I'm going to tell you because this was helpful to me. So uh, there's all of us are either past or future thinkers, um, and and most of us are a little of both. But let me tell you what I mean. There are three possible places that your mind can reside. Number one, it can reside in the past or in the future or in the present. I'm talking about a current, you know, tennis match. And by the way, it happens all the time. Some of you right now are listening to me and you're already thinking about, oh, I hope this doesn't go too long. I got to put the laundry in or whatever. You're in the future. Okay. And some of you are listening to me and right now and you're thinking, 
oh, glad I made it. This guy's pretty cool looking. He's like, <laughs> and you're like, I, you know, but man, that stupid jerk on the way home almost cut me off. And I got here with, and you're, and your mind's in the past about something that happened in the past. So it's normal. Uh, but in tennis, the best thing is to be present. So here's what we've learned over the years. If you are a person who's predominantly your thoughts are in the past, you tend to be angry. So if you don't know what you are, just, you know, if most people would say, yeah, he's kind of an angry player, because what are they angry about? Things, that, errors usually. I just missed the bat. Eh. You know, so someone's generally angry on the court. If you really ask what's upsetting them, it's not that someone cut them off in the on the right there. It's because they just miss a shot or they miss an easy shot or they play the dumb ball. So past generally relates with anger. Um, future relates to nervous. You know, so these people, if you could hear their thoughts, are kind of like, Oh, if I just get this point, then, you know, I can't be the only one to lose. Oh, my gosh, my teammates are up there. So, you know, if I just get up 4-1, then I got enough breathing space. So they, they're they worried, you know, before the match. Oh, my God, I got to play Marabon. That's that famous guy on freaking the YouTube, you know. I think I saw him one day. They had strokes. He looks like he's pretty good. And, you, and you're worried a lot and you're nervous. And the present is great because then you're focused. So let me let me build on this a little bit more. We're going to talk about past. <laughs> these phrases are what they sound like. Well, think of a teammate. Think of someone you play with. If they're always just kind of negative and their inner voice sometimes comes out of voice, these are all simply reactions to something that happened in the past. Okay. Um, the alternative is to be somebody in the future. And what these people, if you could hear them, they say things like, if I win, whew, that'll be great. That'll be such a huge win. Um, if I get this game, I'll be up. 5-2, that'll be, for sure I win the set, and they're already projecting. Uh, if I'm up a break, wow, then then I'm going to at least grab this set, you know. Uh, I can't be the, this is a true story for me. I was playing a college match. Um, all my teammates had won. I was embroiled in a third set marathon match. Everybody's watching me. I'm the last guy. Where every, every one of my teammates won, and I'm really struggling. It's 4-4 four, four in the third, 5-5 five, five in the third, and literally – at about four, four, five, five, instead of concentrating and being, okay, I got to do this on this point, I'm already imagining, man, I can't be that bus ride home <laughs> with all my buddies, you know, when I'm the only one that lost. And really, I was supposed to beat this guy. And I was already thinking it. And I ended up winning the match, barely, but it, it wasn't a good place to be. I was so worried about the ride home, which was not even going to happen for another 25 minutes. Uh, and they tend to be things that bore you okay so obviously the best is present and if you heard those people that are good at the present they think like get this return in it's very present uh search is back in right now uh come in on the next short ball that, that's not future present that's like what i'm going to do now uh play a long point here mayor bond looks super tired and winded he's bending over i'm going to play a long point uh and all these thoughts tend to show that your mind's in the present which tends to show that you're planning okay so that's a really uh, important thing. Maybe some people can type in there which one you, by the way, we're all a little bit of everything, right? Uh, when I, before a match, this is my career, by the way, if you want, type in there in those comments, which you think you are the most, what's your natural factory settings? For me, it was really mostly nervousness when I played. Um, and what I did, like if I was playing an important match, like before the match, I was like almost throwing up. That was just the way I was wired. If it was a meaningful match and I really wanted it, and if it was for a team with my buddies, that made it even more pressure, and I would be nervous. And then in the beginning of the match, I tend to be nervous. As the match unfolded, if I'm winning, things cuddle down. But if I'm losing, then I shifted, and now all my thinking is in the past. I got angry pretty quickly. I'm like, come on, you missed that shot. Come on. Oh, my God, that's... Are you going to make a first serve today or what? Your first serve is a joke, 2%, you know, and I'm just going, you know, bouncing around. So um, I think it's really important to kind of think about where is it that you kind of naturally are. So <clears throat> when I did this, when I first learned about this, uh, the great Dr. Jim Lair, uh, he was talking, and I love that guy. He was like <clears throat> the hero to me. Uh, and he was talking about mantras and the importance of mantras. Mantras is just a positive saying that you say to yourself over and over and over. Um, and he wanted us to come up with some mantras. And I realized I stink at this. Like this, oh, 
what I don't get it. I, I don't like it. I'm not good at it. I don't think this is going to work. So what he did is he put up some like examples of people who, you know, that he coached, by the way, he coached a ton of famous people, number ones. So one positive thing could be, I'm a fighter. That That's an example of a positive mantra. Well, so when things are happening, it's go, Psh, you know, I'm a fighter. Another one is I'm a tough competitor. You can say that to yourself. I love this battle. Yeah, I'm hot, it's nervous, but you know what? I love it, man. I live for this stuff. Another one you can say is I'm willing to suffer. By the way, I always ask, when you, if someone's mantra, I'm willing to suffer, who might that mantra be on the pro tour? You want to take a guess, Mary Vine? Who kind of, when I say this guy's mantra, this gal's mantra. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, Nadal. Yeah. Every time I ask that question, like the whole, eye, Nadal, because he is that. He's like, that's a mantra. You know, he's thinking it. Uh, I feel strong. Uh, I love a challenge. These are all possible mantras. So the reason I put those up there I don't, is I think it's really important that you kind of make up your own. I don't think you need to make six. I need to th I think you need to make two or three. Uh, and they got to be relatable to you. Like for me, I always felt that one of my strengths is I could out strategize people. You know, five foot eight, I wasn't super powerful. I wasn't super tall. I wasn't super fast, but I had a great accuracy. I could serve all kinds of spinny junk serves. And I felt like I could sabotage others' games. So I, one of my mantras when I compete, competed was, I can outsmart this guy. I can outsmart this guy. I can outsmart this guy. Uh, I'll make this guy. Okay, he's on fire now. I'm going to figure out a way. That dude is coming down. I'm going to sabotage him. And I, that's one that worked for me because I actually believed it. So um, don't make a mantra that you don't believe. So, you know, pick two or three. You know, that's the sheet I usually use. Uh, so that now we just did one, and now we're going to go to two, the, the necessity to train under pressure. So um, it's difficult to close out tennis matches. Uh, we have kind of what's called a diabolical scoring system. I'll explain that anyway. Um, and what I mean by that is tennis is just so bizarre, guys. The system, There's points in our sport. What other sport do you earn points? They go on the scoreboard, and then they just come off. So I'm playing marathon, first game of the match. It's a marathon game. I win a bunch of points. He wins a bunch of points. But finally, he closes the game. He gets one. What do I get? Squat, zero. <laughs> Even though I won five, six, seven points, they're basically coming off the scoreboard. <clears throat> that doesn't happen in basketball other than football. You know, you got something to show. So, um, and comebacks are easy. So here's my analogy I love to, to say. So if I'm playing marathon and it's ping pong, and we play up to 21 points in ping pong. And I have 20, and Mirabon has three. It's basically over, okay? Because <laughs> Mirabon is facing 17 consecutive sudden death. If he loses, if he makes one mistake, it's over. So mathematically speaking, that's, that's a lot of, you know, quite a bit of less pressure for me because I know I have that big lead, and I know he can't miss, screw up at all. But let's use tennis in this weird scoring system. Uh, and instead of me being up 21-3 in ping pong, let's say I'm up 5-0 in the third set. That would be great, right? Who wouldn't love, want to be up 5-0 in the third set? Um, so here's what happens. It's not like um, ping pong, right? Because what happens is um, I play, I'm up 5-0. I say 5-0, I start serving, and Mirabon loses the point. But I haven't clinched the match yet. So the point is he can he has some breathing room. Comebacks are easy in our sport because you don't get to sudden death right away. So compared to ping pong, I might play and I win a whole bunch of points and he wins a whole bunch of points that next game, but he wins the game. So now it's five for Jorge and one for Mirabon. And usually if you're the five guy, you're like, no problem. I, I'm up 5-1. No one's usually mad yet. And you think, I got this. And then we play another game, and it's a long game, and I win some points, and Mirabon win points. Next thing you know, Mirabon wins the game. Okay, still hasn't faced any sudden death, or maybe faced match point once, but he fought it out, and, and he's not facing it now. So now it's five to two. So you see how much easier it is to come back in tennis than it is, meaning it's hard to finish people off. <laughs> so now we play at five two. I probably 
don't have too many negative thoughts, I probably would say something to myself like, okay, come on, Jorge, let's get him right. Let's close this right now. Plenty of, of a lead. And now I play a long game. I win points. Mayor Brown wins points. And then bing, bong, 5-3. And now I'm feeling pressure. I'm up 5-3, but the, the negativity, on, and this is in the study, uh, is actually getting bad. Now that person that's up five is usually saying things like, all right, dude, do not blow this. I swear to yeah. God, if I lose this thing being a 5-0, I'm going <laughs> to, you know, and, and we're getting all agitated, okay? And then we play another game, and it goes back and forth, and maybe I have a match point, but he fights off. Next thing you know, he wins a game, and I got five, and I got four. Now the guy with five is so mad, he usually loses the match mm-hmm. because of the way it unfolded. So we have this really weird thing. And so I'm going to do uh, the other thing about tennis scoring is the outcome. Is, it's always uncertain, right? And humans don't like uncertainty. It's not, you know, you can be playing a, a hour long first set and a deep tiebreaker in the heat. And, you know, all this effort, all this sweat and guts and glory in a matter of minutes, I'm either going to grab the whole set or it's going to be set to zero and it's going to go down the drain. And that uncertainty weighs on people. So what do we do about that? So we know that closing out matches is tough. We also know that all points on the scoreboard are worth one. Absolutely true. I, you don't get two points for a sweet winner or a tweener. Everything is worth one. But, man, we also know that those points feel different. They're worth one. They feel different. 15-all, love, love, feels different than four or five, deuce. When I'm certain, you know, it just feels different. And that feels real different than... Five, six, add out, set point. I've been at this set for, you know, so they all feel different, but they're all worth one. So at least let's acknowledge that they feel different. And the key is we got to play more pressure points because tennis doesn't do a good job of putting us in pressure the whole time. It only comes in spurts. So let me tell you what I'm talking about. Let's define a pressure point. Um, I've heard this definition. I swiped it from a coach. Um, pressure points are any points that are 30, 30 or later inside of a game or when it's a set, anytime the score is four, four and deeper. Okay. So marinate on that late in the game, late in the set. That's when things start to feel different, right? So if we use that as our definition, um, here's the deal. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back here. Um, if I played Maribon an hour of singles, the amount of points that we would reach that thing aren't that many. They're going to be like 20 points. Um, so we don't, we think, well, I played today and I got, you know, I kept score. That's pressure. We know they feel different. We got to train more in those other kinds. So what I'll do <coughs> is explain these two games for you. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I coughed and I muted myself. So um, pressure says, this is homework, guys. Do this next time you play singles or doubles. You're going to go out, and instead of playing a match uh, where a lot of it's going to be 1-1, one, one, love, love, you know, no pressure, you're going to play for time, say an hour or whatever it is. And I play Maribon and say, Maribon, here's the deal. Every game starts at 30-30, and every set starts at 4-4. So we're just going to play for time. You might get through eight sets. Who knows? So, okay, sounds good, Jorge. So I go, okay, Maribon, I got the ball. 4-4. Four, four. 30 all, and I serve, and I double fault. Boom. Four, four, add out. Like in that, in literally a mad, a nanosecond, I'm facing break point. Uh, and Mirban hits a winner, and now it's four, five. And now he serves, and I miss a return, and he hits an ace. And that, that set could possibly take about 90 seconds. All right, so start at four, four, start at 30 all. And just play sets, 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 sets. Because by definition, all those are pressure points. And when I do this with students, a lot of them go, okay, that's pretty clever. I think I'll try that. And then they try it, and inevitably one of them hates it, the guy who's losing the most. This is stupid. This is like, and those are the people that need it the most. Uh, why are we doing this? Well, because you obviously don't do it well. You know, you play different. So the sister game, another one that I love to do, is called Deuce and Done. So in this game, I'm going to serve first. I'm going to serve two points only. And then Mirabon's going to serve two points, and I'm going to serve. So I come up and I say deuce. I serve to the deuce court. 
I, and I serve to the ad court, and then it's over. If I won both of those points, then I get the game. Or if Mirabon won both of those points, he gets the game. But if we split the points, which is usually what happens, then neither of us get the game. So you're learning to close out points, and you're, by definition, starting at, at late in the game. So then let's say I had an ace, and then Mirabon hits a return winner. A return winner. It's 0-0. Zero, zero. Now Mirabon serves. Mirabon it serves and I miss a return and then Mirabon serves and his, it wins a point on the fourth ball. He won them both. Now he has one. I got zero. Now I go again. I hit an ace. I hit an ace. Boom. That's two. That's two. I got a point. So back and forth we go and you'll be shocked at how often you're not stringing two points together, which is a really good thing in tennis. So those two games are great homework. Uh, if you're practicing playing sets with friends, just test it out. Do it for fun. And you'll see the, the, how it feels a little bit different. Uh, okay, let's keep uh, cooking with gas over here. And now we're going to talk about the training between points. All right, so there's really two performances in tennis. I, this, I wish I knew this when I was 16, man. It would have helped me so much. I unfortunately learned it when I was in my 20s. So the first performance is the one that we all know about. That's the during the points performance. Hustle, running around, hitting your shots, and basically... During that time, it's, it's difficult to see mental toughness, like I mentioned earlier. But the second performance happens between the points. And that is when it's really easy to see mental toughness. So when I first heard that, it dawned on me, like, I don't, I've never viewed that second performance as a performance. To me, that time between points was rest period. <laughs> yeah. I'm just catching my breath. I don't, I'm not performing right now. But if you look at the best pros, they are definitely having rituals that they do between points. So as soon as I learn, okay, I'm actually never off the clock during a match. I'm, I'm having a performance during the point, and then I have a maybe even more performance, more important performance between the point. So at the end of my coaching career, I would tell my students, including my daughter, let's go out, and your goal today is just have the perfect between point performance. After every point, no matter what happens, high energy, high walk, look at your strings, plan, and, and really master the between point because um, that you can control 100%. Remember that 78% number in the beginning? That's what that is. 82, you know, that's 78% uh, of the time is that. So it's probably smart, guys, to maybe do something in that area. So let's keep going. <clears throat> the 16-second cure is probably the only thing I've seen out there that literally addresses how to train the between point performance. Uh, it was from Dr. Jim Lair at PRPR is the four steps, positive physical response, relaxation, preparation, and rituals. Okay. So all of that is part of his system. And just so you know, Jim Lair claims that he didn't invent it. He kind of discovered it. He was smart enough years ago in the seventies to watch pro footage and he said, let, let me watch only, not even the points, just the, the points between the points. So he had his editor take out all the points and just show nothing but between point, between point, between point. And almost always he could tell just by looking at the between point who probably won the previous point. Um, he also started seeing a pattern of this four-part PRPR that the best pros were doing when they're playing the best. They definitely were doing it. Um, so he, he called it the 16 second cure and he made a video. It was out in the seventies, still super practical. And Jim's a friend of mine. I've been talking about him with this forever to redo it. And last year he redid it. Um, he actually redid it and it's free to the world. It's on gotatennis.com. I'm not related to God of tennis. Those are our friends. I'm sure you know them. Um, uh, mm -hmm. and stuff. And gotatennis.com, if you go to that website right now, right at the top on their upper menu, it says 16 second. You click it, the video is there. This is my, I beg you guys, watch the stinking video. If you really want to know, okay, what do I do, Jorge? I'm, you're starting to convince me. I see, yeah, it's probably important. All the pros work on it. I really haven't done any of it. So what do I do? That's your first step. The video is redone. It's sharp as heck. It's awesome. It's the same data, honestly, because nothing's changed. The best pros are still behaving the same way nowadays than they did then when they're performing well. Okay, so that's a little tip for you guys. Uh, the next thing, four of five tonight, is we're going to talk about 
uh, taking an audit, really two audits. Uh, we're going to talk about how you compete, and then we're going to do an assessment of how do you train, because I don't want you wasting time. So how do you compete? This is the three questions. I've been asking this since I was 20-some years old, a coach. Um, and I want you guys to vote on this and make some comments. For the strokes you have, this is the phrase, listen carefully, for the strokes you currently have, not the ones you want, not the ones you have in your 20, but you, what you have today, which of these describes you the most? So for the strokes you have, I win more matches than I should. Or for the strokes you have, I win about as much as I should. Or for the strokes you have, I win less than I should. So please put some stuff in the thing and tell me, just put more, as much, or less. Uh, or one, two, three. Okay. Mm. So I'm going to tell you something. I've been asking this question all over the planet, literally in different countries. I've asked it to thousands of people. Here's my unofficial breakdown. Look at the screen. Those who say, I win more than I should. Oh, let me go back here. I'm going the wrong way. That represents about 10% of the tennis playing population. There's not that many people walking around going, you know, I have three, five strokes, but I win like a 4 -oh. That's just rare. Okay. You would think number two is the most common. Uh, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, and I think even by our thing, almost our, all of you are voting for three, uh, which is where 60% of the people is, right? So what the heck's going on? By the way, this was my life. I hated it. I always felt like, what the hell? I got these good strokes and I can't win these matches. Like, what's wrong with me? Uh, part of it is I never daunted me to train on the mental toughness or that it was even that important. So this is really important uh, to know because it'll help you. If you said three to this, guess what? Without any change, probably next year you'll vote as three. Ten years from now you'll vote as three. And 20 years from now, you're going, so what the heck? What can we do? So let me tell you some things that work for me. Obviously, this is where most people are, and up there at number one is where you really want to be. I appreciate you guys voting. Here's the problem as I see it. I've been coaching for 40 years, 65,000 hours on the court teaching. Um, we all know there's four things along the bottom there. Everybody trains on these four things if you're a tennis player. They're not unique to me. I do it, you do it, Rafa does it, Federer does it. There's technique, got to work on that, got to know how to hold the ball, and put grips and stuff. There's strategy, got to know not only how to hit the ball, but where to hit the ball. There's mental skills, okay, a uh, big part of it, and there's fitness. Now, most club players are where do you think? Obviously, new players are heavy on technique. That's where they live because that's what they got to learn first. Yeah, how do I hold this thing? How do I swing? Okay, then unfortunately, way too many club players just stay addicted to that, like, like addicts, like every, every uh, missed shot, oh, had to be technique related. No, you really set up your feet wrong. Mm, nah, I don't want to hear that. You know, give me a, a quick tip. Keep my elbow in and they want some quick tip. Um, and here's the bummer, guys. Look at the screen. Hate to say it. That's mm. the problem. Yeah. Way too many people. And you say, well, how do you know? Because here's the deal. Most people that in my orbit that are playing at my club, especially if they're playing USC leagues, they're committed, man. They're spending money. They, they show up. On average, our, our, our league players or our, our USTA players, they're playing four to six hours a week. Let's just say five hours a week times 50 weeks. That's 250 hours a year they're, they're investing. Um, could be privates, you know, group lessons, team practices, whatever. So let's just say 250 hours. And when I ask my players, and I'm asking you all watching, of those 200, let's think of last year, the previous 12 months. Maybe you're only 100, whatever it is. Whether it's 100, 250, or 1,000, I don't care. Whatever the number is, all those hours that you committed and trained, how many of those hours did you dedicate to mental toughness training? And usually, people start looking at each other and... And the honest answer is zero minutes, 0, 0.0 minutes. And then they immediately go, but I don't know what to do. I mean, it's not my fault. I, and they, it's hard, right? Because maybe your club doesn't offer mental toughness privates or mental toughness clinics, or you don't know what book. I never heard of that Gata website. What's it? You know, so you're hearing about it for the first time. <clears throat> but my friends, this is the issue, okay? 
If you've had issues like I had, why am I not winning as much as I should? Why do I always seem to play a little better in practice? We, we cannot ignore mental. Do you think the pros ignore mental? They don't. You don't see it, but many of the best players, they have a physical guy for fitness in their entourage. They have a coach that does technique and strategy usually, and often they'll have a guru, or some, whether they travel or not, that they work with mentally. Um, a lot of them, but we don't see that happening, right? You don't see Federer on the court or in a classroom working with his mental coach, so we think it doesn't happen, but it definitely happens. So the second thing is how do we train? <clears throat> so here's what I'm going to show you. In tennis, there's five. I'm going to give you this form that you're going to be able to swipe if you want. Um, hey, Ian, I love it. I see Ian down there. This has been so helpful to me. In tennis, there's only five play situations, meaning you only do five things ever. That's it. Don't. So here they are. You serve, or you could be returning, or you could be uh, playing for the baseline, or you could be to, at the net or going to the net, transitioning. Or the other guy is, and then you're hitting passive shots and lobs. That's it. Service returns, baseline play, transitioning, and that passes lock. There's nothing else. In any table shot, you will not find another thing that you could be doing. So that's what I use, that, that five-pillar framework, to do it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take these one at a time, and then I'm going to give you QR codes so you can download this whole thing and do your own self-audit. So here we go. Number one is serving. The way I do it is I always put a technical and a tactical. This is Jorge-specific. Jorge this is what I want. I want proper grips and stances, and then I checkpoints on the tactical side. I want to see that my player can change speeds, heights, and locations within the box. Then you give yourself a technical score, and you give yourself a tactical score. And that's that box. Simple as that. I can do that in 30 seconds. The second box is a return. Okay, so there's my tactical. There's my grades. I'm not going to... Don't go too deep in these because you're going to get it. Uh, the third thing is baseline play, which is probably what you do the most, most of us. Okay, so that's my technical and tactical wish list for my players. <laughs> Here is some technique or some grades, right? And then um, here is mental or net play or transitioning. Okay, that's the tactical wish list for me. There would be possible grades. And then the final one, the final play situation is pass your shots and lobs. That's what I want. Uh, this is what possible grades might be. And additionally, coaches, let me go here. This last one is not a play situation, but you should rate yourself as a competitor. And the way I rate people is um, deploy a variety of different tactics against players or not. So if you... If I know that my player, Mayerbond, is my player, and he can play two, three, four different ways, of course he's going to have his favorite way. If he can play three or two or three different ways, I'll give him a three. If he can only play one way no matter what, and if it's not working, he's just going to stay on that sinking ship, he'd get a one. And then the other tactical score is controls emotions and uses a 16-second cure, which is that video I just told you about. So you would do that, and then you would grade yourself. So right here, I'm going to leave this up for a second. Get your phones out. If you want to go and download that file, so it's all on one page, you can do it right there. As a matter of fact, I'm even going to... I got it. Yeah, pop, pop it in there maybe if you don't mind, remember about it in the chat so people can get it. It's free, guys. You don't have to opt oh, in for nothing. Yeah. It's just out there for you to grab. And if you're really serious, this would be a great way. I always have the players do grade yourself and then print a couple copies and then have a friend grade you and then have your coach grade you. And you might realize that, man, I rated myself really high on serving. My coach rates really low, probably an issue. For sure, you're going to be good at one area. Like, hey, baseline, that's, where I, that's what I do best. And for most rec players, net play is not what they do best. Okay, so maybe you look at it. And now, once you take the time to do that, there is your roadmap for the next six months. Okay, mm. I really never liked my return. I'm going to get after that. And look at here. I'm My net game is still low. It's been low. It was low five years ago. It was low 10 years ago. It's going to be low five years from now. So I got to get moving. I got to start, you know, putting attention there. And just don't wander around, 
you know, your tennis career is just like, oh, whatever, I go to my class on Monday, and you know, there's too many of us doing it. So um, I made up that form. I, I love it. People, I give it away for free. People borrow it. I, I think it's really, really helpful. Okay, so what did we cover? Because that was the fifth one. I'll put them all up here. Uh, we've been going for about 45 minutes, and these are the things that we cover. We talked about your inner voice, and I told you that embarrassing story about me. We talked about training under pressure, uh, and I told you that you can play two games that I described. We talked about the training between points, uh, doing the 16-second cure, and actually realizing that there's two performances and not one. I showed you an audit about how much you win given your strokes, and then this audit I just saw. And that last piece is developing a plan. Once you do that form, you fill it out honestly, now you'll know, yeah, I, this is where I need attention uh, and stuff like that. So that's that's the PowerPoint, guys. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, but that's really been, okay, did I stop sharing it already? Yeah. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so, yeah, happy to, you know, uh, answer any questions, but. As a pro who's taught this many hours and also personally as a competitor, had plenty of demons and plenty of, you know, choking and anger issues and stuff. And then as a young coach, having the inability to coach someone on this, like, you know, when I was 20 something and I had a hot head kid, I just say, hey, dude, don't get mad. And that's like completely useless type of advice. Um, but now there's things you can do. OK, uh, in these courses, a lot of the online, I mean, wasn't today mental toughness training day? Um, mm -hmm. You know, so there you go. That's for free for a while. Like, you got to lift a finger and do something in this area. And they can't. Next year, if you say, okay, I did another 250 hours of training in 2023, how many hours was in, in mental toughness? The answer could not be zero. That's on you if it is. Uh, you got to get out and do something. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, I really appreciate, you know, you laying down the framework for us. And I mean, the sheet in itself is just so awesome. It's yeah, this is great. I mean, like you said, just check it out. I put the link in the comments section so you can just click it there. If you can get the QR code to work and then, you know, fill it out. And that's your roadmap, like Jorge said. So really exciting stuff. Um, see, Jamie says, I feel like this summit is the only yeah. mental training I get all year um yeah it's you got to definitely definitely keep training that keep be cognizant of it i think it's it's probably like the big you know the most important thing and like you said it's not utilized at all and 70 percent of the time is is you've got time to to you know have a mental game routine and, and things like that so um let's get to some questions here uh jorge so we got one from brian so i see so i have the problem i can't seem to return serve good or well and i know my mind wanders when waiting so um any advice on you know mind wandering <laughs> while returning yeah so to me that that's kind of part of the the rituals that you would learn in that 16 second cure uh what they are is pr pr i'll just explain it p the first p stands for positive physical response so right after the point whether i had a sweet winner or a loser i have some positive think rafa immediately even if he doesn't Hit a great shot. Boom, he'll just slap his thigh, shows determination, nothing like, oh, you know, none of this whiny body posture, right? Then the then the R is relaxation. It usually happens behind the baseline. That's when they're looking and they're at their strings. You see how many pros look at their strings uh, and fidget with them. That's just resting their eyes so their eyes don't wander all over, you know, the stadium. Uh, and they're catching their breath. And now they turn to the opponent and they get ready. Let's say I'm serving. And that's preparation where I come up and I say, okay, whew, the score is 30, you know, score is 4 4, and it's my ad, and I'm going to play this point here. Uh, and then the rich, the R, the last R is rituals where I bounce the ball, or if I'm returning, I get my footwork how I like, and then I repeat. So it seems to me, right when you get ready to return, make sure you're planning. Step number one, I highly recommend you give yourself a target. Uh, for years, I, I had no target. You know, my target was uh, the, the other side. I mean, get it in. But I like to call the, the ad target, if I'm facing that way, the deuce target, the service box is one. Target behind it is two. Over to the ad is three. And then the short on the ad inside the service box is four. 
four giant targets. If you do nothing more than just kind of pick a target and say, Mayor Brown's got a big fat forehand and he's right handed. So I'm not going to hit to target two, which is deep to that side. I'm going to hit short and over here and just give yourself a target. Um, it, that'll help a lot. Uh, most people have zero target. It doesn't even occur to them. Their target is the whole giant court, like a serve, like your serve target can't be the serve box. It should be a little more, you know, I'm going to get it to this side of the serve box because, you know, his forehand or backhand or whatever. So that would be a good one. Um, and I have a video on there. And later we'll talk about the, the bonus I'm going to give. And I'll show that person exactly where to go find that video. Awesome. Thanks, Jorge. So we had a couple comments about um, how players, you know, Amy here, I'm still thinking about my match on Wednesday. Jamie, same, still thinking about my last two singles matches. So I guess i um, trying to frame my question. I mean, is that, is that a problem or I don't know, like what, what are your thoughts on thinking about the matches? Like, is it okay if just you think about it from an analytical standpoint, as long as you don't let it, you know, affect your yeah. play negatively? Yeah. So one of the things that, um, it, well, you should only lose the match one time and I'll tell you about that. But basically in this thing, if you watch that 16 second cure video, it talks about tanking is the, the worst thing where you don't even, you give up basically. And then uh, anger is next. And then as you move closer to the bullseye, it's choking. So choking usually is a pretty bad word. You call someone a choker, it's like, but choking is actually one of the baddest states to be in because you're still trying, you're not getting mad, and you care. Choking just means you care. Maybe you care too much. So that's why, you know, you're overdoing it. But one of the things that I was fairly famous for, if I took a tough loss, Okay, I lost the match one time on the court. But then I would come off, and then, you know, my friend, how'd it go? Oh, and I relive it, and I tell him how I choked it in the end, and I miss his shot, and the guy, you know, so now I'm marinating in that, uh, and now I've really lost it twice because I had to relive it. And then I get home, and my mom or dad says, how'd it go? And then I tell him a third time. And then I see my girlfriend, that you know. At one point, you only lose a match one time. You don't have to suffer six times, right? So I do believe that there is a thing about moving on. Um, I like to use these forms or after the match is done, whether I play good or bad, uh, real simple. What did they do? What did I do well? If I play this person next time, what would I do? And literally write it out. I even have a Google form for that for our players. <coughs> so, and then that's it. Learn from it, but don't dwell on it. And, uh, Sometimes it's really hard because we love tennis. We care. The more time you put in it, the more heartache it is when you lose. So that seems to help me. Awesome. Awesome. Very good. Amy says, yep, I'm always trying to tell myself this is the only point that matters. Staying in the present. Some of the best athletes, like they say the best, like a quarterback in the NFL, there's a phrase that's been around for years. The best attribute of a quarterback is a, a short memory. So if they throw interception and then they have another one, and they miss an easy open pass, you got to forget about that. If they're like, ah, so the best people have that. And I think it's true for tennis, a short memory yeah. on both sides. If even if you hit a winner, you're not like celebrating that tennis shot. Oh, remember, you know, um, you learn from it and you, and you move on. The only benefit of thing in the past is literally what you can learn. Um, you know, all right. On that one, I chit to return. I can't chip my returns against these guys. He, you know, it leaves the ball short and he dominates me. So I got to hit it. That's all I need to know from that point. Now let's, let's go forward. Uh, but these are all super easy things to say, but it takes time to practice them and put them into, into use. Yeah, definitely. It takes hard work. Let's see, Chris, the real question is at what point does skill just overcome the mental to where you can just focus on execution, regardless of your emotional disposition? I don't know if that's ever the case because I think John McEnroe is famously quoted for saying that everybody chokes. Um, I think yeah. that you don't see it from the very best players a lot, but I think even Rafa and Feder would tell you, yeah, I choked that one. And, you know, I didn't, you know, I got a little nervous. I thought about it. Uh, some people are overwhelmed with it. Um, like I was when I competed, especially in the juniors. Um, I would say that the more trust you have in their strokes, the less likely you'll be rubbing elbows with nervousness because you kind of trust it. 
But I know really good players that have like an unbelievable forehand. And if they miss two or three on key points, even as good as it is, all of a sudden they're like, what's going on with me today? And they interpret it. That's just human nature. So it's partly true. But I don't think even the best players ever get to the point like my like Federer strokes are so clean and perfect that he doesn't ever choke. I think, you know, it's hard to come up with a time to say, when's the last time Federer really choked it where the whole world knew he choked it? He didn't do a lot of that. But he would be the first to admit there was times where I played nervous and maybe I did choke it. Choking is playing nervous. Um, it's not necessarily losing. Uh, it, it's where you can't you know, perform to your normal level. That's really how I define it. Um, so if you play a match, and let's say I'm a 4-0 player, and I play a match for fun and I play at the 4-0 level, that's good. But now I play the state tournament, and it comes down to me, and if we win, we're going on to nationals, baby. And that's another 4-0 match, but it feels different, right? The goal is if you play your normal 4-0 level, that is the definition of mental toughness. You took this high pressure situation and you didn't go down. Most people erroneously define it to say, well, it's the state tournament. So I should be playing like a 4-2 today. Actually, I, I have to play great because this is like the world championships or whatever. And in their attempt to play like a 4.2, they play like a 3.7 because they're trying shots they don't own. So if you play at your normal level when it matters the most, that is mental toughness. It's not playing at your unbelievable best when it counted. That's just damn lucky uh, if that happens. But that's your, if that's your goal, you're going to be constantly telling yourself you're not mentally tough. Um, so please define that correctly. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thanks, um, Jorge. Philip, uh, my wine. Sorry, my mind wanders. I tend to be future oriented. Like, man, some Cane's chicken would be pretty good right now. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I will give you a couple of tricks. Uh, during the point, if your mind wanders, it, that 16-second cure is very helpful. Sometimes people wander during the, like, actually during the rally. So one thing that really helps you focus is just do simple, uh, assign your mind some job. Like count the balls. One, two, three. Just count because when you're thinking about that, you won't be wandering off about Kane's chicken um, or hit top spin, underspin. Just call out your spin, call the number of shots, call the number of steps you take. Um, say yellow, red, green to yourself. Like this one, I'm going to hit harder. It's green. This one's a rally ball. It's yellow. This is I'm in trouble. I'm red. Anything that occupies your mind during the point is super helpful to calm down those nerves and not let you wander around. I, I've used that personally. Uh, a lot and it helps me stay on point awesome awesome thanks a lot uh, let's see uh, paul says future slash nervousness i think there's a reply to your um, poll there my other issue is very immediate past analyzing my technique in the middle of a point a middle of the point wow that can happen you have students um, like that jorge yeah yeah or right after the point and the right danger there is you know, the last thing you want to be doing is thinking, you know, because obviously when you play, you're hoping to be in a flow state and just using your strokes and going on autopilot. Thinking about um, tactics is one thing and planning, that's okay. But thinking about technical strokes is highly risky because most people in the middle of a match or a point aren't going to be changing technique much. Usually if they're thinking about their, their technique, they're starting to lose a little confidence. Maybe my forehand's pretty good, but I just missed three, on, you know, for no reason. I don't know why am I doing it. And you start, you see the pros, you know, after a missed shot, sometimes they'll shadow the shot, the same shot in the air three times. Um, that's fine. But like, just kind of like, uh, you know, uh, as a coach who does a lot of coaching in practice of match play of juniors. So it's match play practice, but I'm coaching, I'm roaming around. They I can't tell you, they miss a shot and they're like, they look like what? Tell me what they want a quick tip. They want like a, like Jorge's, oh, dude, loosen your grip 10%. That, and, oh, thanks, coach. So, they, so, and that's not how you, you learn, you know. I, I usually, why did I miss it in the net? I go, why do you think you missed it in the net? Because I want them to, that's what they're going to have to do when they're on their own, right? Okay. And, they, and they don't like that. They're like, well, I'm paying you, to, you know, you're the coach. You're paying me to make you better. I give you all the answers. So real quick, what do you think 
in your opinion, what I'll tell you if you're wrong, but why do you think you went with that? Uh, and that people that's called guided discovery is a really effective way of teaching, but a lot of recipients don't like it because they want to just get the tip. Oh, I love Jim, the pro he's out there. Dude, that guy, and he's just spouting out, he's spewing out verbal diarrhea. I love, I love that guy. Um, but those guys don't generally develop tons of great players. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see here. Tom says, Igor Sviantek has a mental, I think probably mental coach on tour where they're in her box. That's true. Yeah. I mean, a lot, a lot more. Well, in my opinion, all the top hundred are doing something, whether they can afford their own person or if they're just having someone work with them, but not just them. Someone like Iga and these super billionaires, they probably have their own person that's just dedicated to them. Um, and, you know, there's lots of books now. This The 16 second... Well, the video, the 16 second cure, I love because it actually is like, do these four steps and they're, and you can practice them just like a forehand. Uh, the 16 or the, the, the book, uh, the inner game of tennis is just, just opened my mind and kind of helped me understand why I was being such a maniac. So those are two assignments. I mean, when I, I don't teach a lot of private lessons anymore, but in my near the end, when I was. That was a prerequisite. If you want to work with me, you got to know, you got to watch the 16 second cure, pass a test that I made, and you got to commit to reading the uh, um, inner game of tennis. And if you don't want to, I love you, but you're not going to be my private student. And luckily, I had enough, I had a wait list of people that wanted private so I could be <laughs> bossy like that. <laughs> love that. Love that. Yeah. Good test there. Uh, Raquel, such great session. So much great information shared. Thank you very, very much. Uh, our pleasure. Um, thanks to all the coaches like Jorge, all the great info. Um, let's see. Andres, be the ball. Ty Webb. That's a good saying. Um, let's see. Tom, great job, Jorge. Thanks for the autograph custom. Uh, not in the book I got from you two months ago. Wow. Uh, one second. I think... Uh, Oh, I think you're on mute, Jorge. Yeah, it's all right. I think he's talking about this book. Oh, sweet. That's a little strategy book I wrote a while back. Sweet. Oh, you autographed it too? Yeah, if people order uh, strategybooklet.com, if they order it and ask me to do it, I'll, I'll do that. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Love it. Um, let's see. Jamie, as an analytical type, I think I should be able to outsmart people because I have a lot of variety in my game. In reality, though, I fail to observe my opponent enough to choose wisely. Yeah. So how important is that to observe? Because, you know, I was I was talking with Paul earlier today and, you know, he said that, you know, essentially you want to prioritize like what your strengths and to try to play to them. But then ob obviously also you want to you know, understand your opponent's weaknesses. So, um, yeah, any thoughts about Jamie's comment here? Yeah, I think there, it's important. So the very first course, online course I ever did was called Building Tennis IQ. And in it, I described three levels of tennis IQ. And the third one is what she's talking about. Mean, so here's what they are in my view. Level one of tennis IQ is for kind of beginner level. It's just the ball and the player, and you're just trying to, receive it right and and know what to do based on that okay people get through that pretty quickly then they go to level two of tennis iq which is i'm aware of my side of the court i know if i'm in the court or backing up i know if i got a tough strike zone or a nice strike zone i know if i'm in trouble or neutral or defense and they start actually making wise choices i'm in a good spot i drive i'm in a bad spot i loop you know so that's a lot of people don't get there ever, but that's where a lot of people stall out. And the third level of tennis IQ is not about my side of the court. It's about the other side of the court. So now at that level, I do all the right stuff here. I'm making plan decisions, but I'm also able to think about that side and what that person may not like and what I better not send them because they love. And I always use Rafa. I think all the pros do this, but Rafa, when he played literally for decades against Federer, what it, everybody knew the plan going in. He's going to hit his famous top spin, you know, loopy forehand. He's going to hit it to Federer's backhand. He wants Federer to hit it above the shoulder because it's difficult. It's Federer. He's not going to whiff it, but it's going to come back a lot less, you know, penetrating. So he would send stuff to be deliberately 
disruptive. And I think a lot of people <clears throat> think it's me. I, I, I lost a bear bond because I didn't hit good enough shots. And it could be that you were hitting these beautiful shots that just happened to be exactly what Mirabon wants. And you, without intending it, you became his human ball machine. You were just sending him all these shots. He played great. You're like, why is this guy freaking Mirabon? Every time I play him, he plays out of his mind. I hate this. He just get lucky. And it's my fault, but I don't realize it because I'm not, I'm not, I'm being a human ball machine. Uh, people, the way we generally hit is kind of ball machine drives that kind of go deep in the court. That's what, what people like. That's how they set up the ball machine when they want to practice. No one sets up the ball machine to receive loopy balls up in strike zone four. So we should be just like a ball machine, able to change our dials and send out all kinds of crap. But yeah, it's all about that side. Uh, but I call that level three and a lot of people don't, it doesn't, even some of you listening right now are probably going, eh, I don't think I've ever thought about that um it's all about me you're the second most important person on the tennis court when you play a match sounds weird right the first most important is the other opponent and what can i do to make him not play so great it's not about me playing my best uh it's about making sure this guy plays a little lower than me yeah. whatever that might take yeah yeah for sure all right i forgot to ask you i mean we're obviously past nine are you all right still for a little while or yeah, I'm fine, and I can, you know, I got my my bonus teed up over here, so you tell me whenever, and I'm happy to. I'm at home now, so I'm not going anywhere. I got my little doggy back there. Oh, you're not going partying out tonight? <laughs> I was going to, but I'm not saying. <laughs> okay, same here, same here. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. We have a, a ton of questions still, so we might not get to all of them, but, you know, we'll we'll get to a good amount of them, and obviously I'll leave you some time to talk about your bonus, which is awesome, and we appreciate it. So, uh, let's see here, Lisa. I've looked up mental toughness, listened to podcasts, and I've seen heard a different definition from each one, and none with practical things to do. So, I'm glad that Jorge is here to clear things up. <laughs> yeah, I think the, that's what I love so much about the 16 second cure because it that was my deal when I really needed it, it didn't exist. And then I spun, spun up, I stumbled upon it late as a college player. I only played one year of college tennis and our program got canceled. So by about age 20, I was done. I just played USGA adult tournaments. And nowadays they'll, those don't hardly exist around where I live anyway. Um, but I, I needed it as a coach, like how do I teach people are paying me to, to teach them tennis and I don't know how to teach them mental toughness. So when I learned that I'm like, dude, I can teach people that it's very deliberate and very, good i mean it's it's so awesome it's it's the best but you're right um and part of the reason most rec players don't get mental training is very few clubs offer it like at my club you can take a mental tennis or you can take a mental private lesson mental skills private lesson my wife dies them i will do them occasionally and it's not necessarily on the court so it might be on the court we work about how you but generally they're off the court getting you aligned like why do you even play why are you miserable about this sport, the, the yellow ball that costs $1 and you're making your wife or husband miserable because you're, you know, we just get them aligned with like, okay, what's, why do I play? You know? Um, and a lot of that stuff is helpful, but it's, it's not out there a lot. Thankfully, you know, because of things like what you did here, Maribel, with a whole mental day. And now there's a lot more resources online. When I, and when I was playing tennis 40 years ago, competitively as a college kid, there was like zero. Mm. There wasn't a mental toughness, you know, video on YouTube. YouTube didn't even exist back then. So mm -hmm. you kind of had to suffer through it, maybe find a book, uh, maybe find a coach that could teach you that. But even then, let me tell you, teach you your mental toughness skills. A lot of people are like, yeah, I'm not paying you for that. I need a better forehand. So um, it's come a long way and there's a lot more options now. So it's even less, you know, of an excuse to not, train a little bit in that area yeah it's just amazing the resources yeah i don't i don't remember you did youtube exist in 2003 i mean that's when i went to college but yeah i wish we had what we had now or have now excuse me uh andres uh to uh, uh ty webb there's another that's another quote from there's a force in the universe that makes things happen and all you have to do is get in touch with it stop thinking let things happen and be the ball nice quote i like that 
Um, let's see. Alan, the kid looks great in practice, but he can't get it done in matches. How do we build confidence to play better in a match? So to me, I go right to those two games I talked about. When yeah. I hear that, I assume for with my years of experience, that kid is playing uh, probably not enough practice, not enough competitive matches. And if he is, not enough in pressure points. So this is what happens to me. At my club, we got a huge junior program. I'm here in Holland, Michigan. And 90% of the kids come into my junior program. Their number one goal, not to go pro. It's not even to play D1 college. They want to make their varsity tennis team. High school tennis is a huge thing near me. So it's like all my customers. That's why they train year-round, right? So, um, But the mistake they make is they take private, they take another private, they take a group, they do three groups. And in their training regimen, there's no match play. Did you play a match yet? Eh, you know, I don't want to call somebody. You should play a tournament, man. So what happens is they, they're setting themselves up for failure, and that failure happens during tryout week, which, by the way, in Michigan was about a month ago. We had tryouts. They train all winter. They come out of winter. Girls do tryouts in, in March. And there's always a handful that are like, oh, my God, I – wow. I fell apart. I'm not, I didn't make varsity or I didn't make singles. And you look close and you're like, wow, you did all these drills, but you never took a test. You never played a match. You didn't even know that your serve was a double fault problem until you played the match and it's too late because now the coach just put you on, on JV. So um, I think I would have him play those 30-30 games, uh, deuce and done, uh, to see if that helps because that, that, that helps and still to this day helps a lot of my players. Yeah, yeah, it's super helpful. Um, let's see here. Artie, awesome presentation. Learning a lot. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Artie. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Jamie, what's frustrating is in the moment I need a short memory, but after I have no recollection of what worked or what didn't because I forgot everything already. Hmm. Um, I would tell you that um, if you were, if Jim Blair, who was a lot smarter than me, he would tell you that you should be journaling. Um, after matches mm. immediately uh, two or three things I did not so good today two or three things I did pretty good um, what and the big one is what would I do next time I play this person even if you win you should write that down I won four and four next time I play them I gotta just keep the ball deep and play a lot more balls to the backhand um, and then because if you don't write that down and then you play someone six months later which happens in USTA league tennis all the time you don't know God, I, I played that guy. I think I beat him. I can't tell you how I beat him. I had no memories of that. So if you could just go to a notebook and it's all there. Oh, I'm playing this guy. Wow. Whoa, three years ago, I said, do not let this guy come to the net. Okay. That's good to know right now at the beginning and not, you know, at the end of the first set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, uh, interesting. I'll, LA. Uh uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Um, anything to prevent tanking? Hard to snap out of it once I get so down. Huh. Yeah, so tanking is specifically talked about in the 16-second cure. He's got a bullseye of what you're aiming for, and tanking is the most primitive outside thing because you're, you're giving up. And honestly, um, the people that tank, I don't want to offend anybody, but here's what generally is happening. Um, That's a stressful match. You want to win really bad. Uh, it's not maybe going your way. So tanking basically means you just kind of give up. Uh, and usually it's manufactured. I can't tell you how many times I'll see this. Uh, a kid's suffering. He's kind of getting mad. I'm playing Maribond. I should win. Or th I think I should win. Next thing you know, I'm like, wow. You know, and, and, uh, and then all of a sudden there's an accusation. What you call that? Oh, Maribond, you call that out? Oh, my God. Oh my, and they're nice and loud about it. And then they tank and they stop trying and they just go through the motions. And then after the match, what happened? Well, the guy cheated me so bad, whatever, he wants to have it. And, that, and they escape. It's an escape route, tanking. Because the, uh, the opposite is to keep fighting your butt off and risk that you lose and come off the match and say, man, I fought to the end and the guy still beat me. It's a lot more easy on the ego to just kind of give up and say, whatever the guy was a jerk i didn't feel it today i mean i probably would have won if i tried but you can see i didn't try it, you know 
So it's an escape mechanism. I did it. I didn't do it a lot, but I did it a couple times. Uh, and that was what's happening with me. And I've had kids that are notorious for it over my 40 years, you can imagine. I didn't have tons of these kids, but I can think of three or four names that come in my mind. I won't share them here that were pretty bad at it when the going got tough rather than just fight it out and, and, you know, still try to the bitter end, they would just find a way to stop trying. Uh, they would go through the motions and wouldn't necessarily retire from the match, but you could tell like, okay, they've given up there. They look disinterested, sir, whatever. You see Nick Carrios will tank once in a while. Uh, you hardly ever see it at the pro level because they're playing for money, but you'll do it. You see what it looks like. And it's like, whatever. Guy hits a serve, doesn't even make a, a move towards it. So that watch that video. It's very enlightening. Yeah, sad to say I actually did tank. I remember I had like a – we were doing tryouts for maybe my second or third year in college, and a really good freshman came, and he – you know, who was just winning, you know, every game. And I just like, I don't know, something snapped in me. I just went berserk and I just tanked. And then, um, you know, my, my coach rightly dropped me for the first several matches or something like that. And, and then I just kind of realized like, Hey, I can't do this again. You know, uh, right. it was bad, bad character. Um, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'd obviously, you know, it happens. You just got to learn from it and have that fighter mindset. So yeah, we've, I'm sure we've all, all done it. Um, let's see. Let's try to take a couple more. Inner game change more about how I practice and how I compete. Maybe I should reread it again. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's both. I mean, the guy who wrote it as a tennis teacher, he's like me. He taught tennis for a living. And then it caught on. His way caught on. And it was like on CBS 60 minutes. I mean, it, it was a phenomenon back then. And it talks a lot about his teaching method of not saying too much and just saying, what does that feel like guided discovery basically um but there is a lot in there about you know self one self two which is helped me as a player uh like why am i being mad and what you know um what i learned i remember exactly the day i read it and the next match i played i was trying to use it i remember what it was i hit a backhand return in the net and instead of my usual thing which is like Oh my God, I, I just would analyze it. I'd hit it in the net and say, okay, I went in the net. So it was unemotional. Um, so here's a good way I think about um, let's say I'm playing Maribond as an emotional match and I, we both want it. And I hit a backhand down the line and it's out by six inches. Okay. So is this a good thing, a bad thing, or neither, or both? And I'm going to show you it's neither, but. Of course, what do I think? I'm the guy that just hit it wide on a big point. I think it's bad, right? What does Mirabon think? He was at the net and went whizzing by him, but it's out. He thinks it's what? Good. What does the chair umpire think? Yeah. We have to think like the chair umpire. We can't assign good, bad, all this, all this emotional baggage to a shot. It's just data. I hit it. It went wide. That means I hit it that way. I got to hit it more this way so it goes more straight. That's how you think. Not like, oh, my God. Yeah. So if we can think of the umpire. So obviously it's neither because it can't be all three, right? It's just a shot that went wide, and you can learn a little bit from it because what makes it go wide is I push it too far that way, and I straighten my racket out, and I'll go straight. So use that, and then leave it. So just think about it. So I would hit the ball, return the net, and then instead of, like, judging it, I would say, okay, next one, I got to have my racket face all open. And then if you if you quiet your mind and not immediately start yelling at yourself like the like the crazy person on the sidelines might, um, then you have a chance to get better at this. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Let's see if we can sneak one more. Uh, this is a very interesting one. Let's talk about visualization. I visualize often. So... Uh, this person visualizes the beautiful shots I made in the past, good footwork, tough balls made over the net. But then in the match, I get that shorter ball, which I put away many times, uh, visually especially, and then I have, you know, and then I miss it. So um, I guess what's the dichotomy there? Well, in my opinion, I think visualization has been super proven. I don't think a lot of people do it, to be honest with it, but I know a lot of really, really high-level athletes do it. Yeah. And there's studies, right? I think I oof, probably in the 80s, I heard about a study that they did with prisoners. And it was 
they wanted to see the power of visualization and they took two groups of prisoners and they had them shoot free throws uh, to get a base, right? And then, so 10 prisoners shot free throws in group A and in group B, so they got a, a, a baseline judgment. And then for the next month, 30 days in a row, group B came out and shot 100 shots, actual shots. And group C, uh, A didn't do that, but they had to meditate and visualize 100 shots. So they got mind practice. The other group got actual practice. They brought them back a month later, and everybody that did the visual did better. They, they both did better, but the visual group went higher without actually doing it, just by visualizing it. When I read that, I'm like, what? You know, I, I think I was a young pro when I read that. It was taught to me in a seminar, I think. And I'm like, whoa, because I, you know, I was one of these guys. If you would have told me at age 18, you got to visualize your strokes, I would have been like, Meh. you know, that's not going to make me a better dude. I need a better forehand. Help me with that. But it, I talked to a friend of mine who coached a Wimbledon finalist. I don't know if he wants me to tell this story, but uh, before and after every match, it's not a bad story. Uh, they did hours of visualization, hours wow. a night. And I'm like, and if yeah. this person didn't do it, it was visually or it was super obvious that they weren't playing at their best. So they that was just built into their nightly routine. Uh, they do one hour in the morning and two hours in the evening of that. And I'm like, whoa, that's that's a big commitment. Wow. Wow, that's incredible. Well, um, in the interest of time, uh, let's, uh, Jorge, maybe we want to talk about um, the really cool bonus that you have in store for us. Yeah. So, guys, um, obviously, I hope you're all taking advantage of, you know, the free sessions at um, Tennis Summit. Uh, there's a couple of these summits, right? Peter does one, your buddy. These things are so awesome, and they're so easy to promote. As someone, you know, I'm one of the I'm, online guys that's promoting the summit. Uh, and it's such an easy thing to do because I'm basically sending people to free stuff. And probably 90% of the people that go will never buy anything. But why not watch the free stuff? So um, what I'm going to show you, and of course, I would like you to buy from my link. And Ian would like you to buy from his. That's all fine. But I'm going to share my thing to show you what my bonus is. Um, and make sure I do this correctly. So let me see. Got it. There we go. So I have a tennis drills website that is mostly for coaches, but recently I've started offering this as bonuses and people have been loving it. So if you buy uh, a lifetime access pass, uh, I'm going to give you three months of un unfiltered access to this website that has over 4,000 videos on it. Now, the reason I'm going to show it to you is because I'm going to show you where to go. Because if you are a player, if you're a coach, you're going to love it. But if you're a player, um, so real quickly, it's the website started for tennis coaches and I have all these types of group drills that you can do. So if you go to singles as an example, um, you can see that just in the singles library alone, I have 283 um, drills. Okay. Now, if you're a player, you might want to watch this because you probably practice with friends. And they're all high def videos. And this is me showing that video with that lesson. And we got cool cameras and multiple angles of cameras, top camera, side of cameras. Good. So there's probably a lot in there. And there's literally 2,000 of them. Every video you watch, you can print a diagram and it will show you the diagram of that particular drill. So if you want that. But probably it's not where I would push you. I would say for players, the singles and the doubles strategy areas, um, like 16 ways to beat these different types. This is how to beat the moon baller. Tactic one, tactic two, tactic, all the way to seven. So what happens is tactic one is sneak in and pick off a volley or tactic two. So this is me. By the way, this, this is based on that book. Um, it's literally a version of this book. It's the video version. So you say, well, how do I sneak in and pick off a volley? That's what the lessons are. You watch this, and that's me on the court teaching this guy how to do that skill. So imagine getting basically a private lesson with me 
on how to beat the moon baller, the steady baseliner, the runner pusher, the aggressive baseliner, you know, all these types of styles. And if you're a doubles person, don't worry, because I got you covered too. How to beat teams that pull you a lot, rush and crush, stay back, the one up one team. So that's one, another area, the drills and the strategy. And then also the lab. So in the lab is now not drills, but they're courses, entire courses. So this is where most are. And if I click on this, you'll see a lot of these are for tennis coaches, like drill mastery, tips for coaches, feeding tennis balls. But parents coaches, um, there's all kinds of stuff here. Match charting, that could be interesting to a player. Uh, return and serve practice, teaching aggressive tennis. These are all courses that once you go in them, here's this would be a perfect one, the six zones of singles. Uh, by Mark Fairchild, my buddy, he's a master professional, won national titles himself. And he teaches for a whole hour uh, on the court of uh, the six zones of singles and the shots you should be hitting, and you're actually all on the court. Uh, so 2,000 tennis drills and over 4,000 total videos. And rather than just give you access to a course, I'm going to give you access to all of them. There's fitness sections, mental toughness sections, um, masterminds. And lastly, I'll end with this. I have these deep dives into f teaching to serve the forehand and backhand, and they're very technical in nature, meaning that you go into the course and you can see, you know, different ways of learning. This would be perfect. Technical checkpoints along the way that you could, you should know. But here's the best part. All these courses have error corrections. Fixing the ritual, fixing the weight transfer, fixing the ball toss, fixing the trophy, fixing the bracket drop. Here's more, fixing the elbow, errant tosses, how to spin. Every one of these is a separate video. And just in the lab and just in the technique area, that's my day, by the way, um, you get me teaching how to fix all these things. So in the matter of those months, uh, you can literally watch 4,000, you won't, but you can watch up to 4,000 videos um, all right here on that website. So um, that whole upper menu bar, I used to just give away a course. Like I would say, my bonus is going to be the lab and I'm going to give away the forehand technique course. Well, now you're going to have access to over 100 courses, 2,000 drills, um, all for that time. So that's it. I'll stop sharing. But if that floats your boat, you think that would be helpful, then go ahead by my uh, through my link. However, if there's going to be some pretty sweet bonuses. I know there are. So if some of the bonuses um, speak to you differently, like, hey, I'd rather, um, you know, have Ian's bonus because that's more what I need at the moment then definitely buy through him. Do what's best for you guys. But I appreciate just the chance to show what my bonus looks like. Yeah, of course. I really appreciate it, Jorge. It's very cool. And yeah, there's obviously different bonuses. And, you know, it's interesting too, you know, some coaches offer them at different periods of the summit. So it's kind of hard, um, you know, for for some to like, you know, for us to adjust to like, you know, get you to a different bonus or whatever. But right. um but yeah, I definitely highly encourage you to take advantage. Um, if you've already bought, um, you can shoot me a message and I'll see if I can swing anything for you. But I do want to just, you know, put the whole thing in perspective in terms of like what you will get, which is like pretty awesome value in my opinion. You know, like you're getting, um, oops, let me go to the other screen. So you're getting, you know, lifetime access to all 40 plus summit master classes, which in itself, you know, is like amazing value already for what you're paying. Then you also get the audio MP3 downloads of all the summit sessions. So, you know, it's almost like you have a podcast, like wherever you go. Like I, I listen to them in the car, like even in the shower, to be honest, probably TMI there. But, um, you know, while I'm cooking, things like that. And then you get the transcripts of all the summit sessions, which my team is working hard at right now. So they'll be uploaded uh, all eventually. You also get a, a tennis summit implementation worksheet to help you pick out the top lessons, um, you know, to work through them and document them yourself. And then you get access to the summit Facebook group where we discuss tennis and, um, you can post questions in there and then also, uh, members only live stream with me and then, um, special deals and discounts as well that I'll post in the Facebook, um, group and also like underneath the videos uh, of the master classes in your members account. And then also, here we go, access to TennisDrills.tv for three months, which is a really mm -hmm. cool value. Um, thank you again, Jorge. 
Uh, so yeah, it's really awesome stuff, and uh, definitely highly, highly encourage you if you haven't gotten the All Access Pass yet to take advantage of this one. And um, again, I'll just put Jorge's link in here. So I uh, encourage you to click on that and take advantage and get all this stuff. So yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I mean, I think it's just a great you know resource for you. It's like a library of lessons. You know, you're playing and you think, oh, maybe. My strategy was off today. My double strategy, like, well, you know, let me go back to a lesson, you know, from the summit. So if you have the all access pass, you can do that, you know, go back to any of the, I think, six or so mental game sessions today that we had um, with, you know, Jorge, Paul Anico, Jeff Greenwald, so many great ones today. Um, and it's just a great, great uh, resource. So definitely check out the link there. Um, contact me if you have any questions and yeah, I really appreciate your time, Jorge. Um, Thanks, any other Thanks for joining oh, us today. Of course. Yeah. Any, any last, just, you know, last thoughts or anything mm -hmm. about, uh, just generally. Um, about no, anything? I just want to thank you. I know it's a, a nightmarish amount of work to interview 40 <laughs> people separately, put it all together, the links, the web pages, all that stuff. I can't imagine, but yeah, uh, it's a really gift to the tenants community because, uh, especially the, I just like summits in general because, it's free. I mean, everybody gets to look at it for free. And if that's all they want to do, that's fine. And you got the benefit. But then for a little bit more, you get the life lifetime access pass. So like I said, it's easy to promote. It's super. I never ashamed to email it out or like even emailing people too much because I'm basically sending them to mostly free stuff. So I appreciate you putting it together again. Let me be a part of it. Yeah, thanks, Todd Jorge. I just really appreciate your contributions. You know, the, the great video you did on double strategy drills and then, um, you know, today and, uh, you know, just spreading the word about the event and for the kind words. So, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. We'll be back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Um, with a tennis elbow lesson, I believe. Let me double check my <laughs> calendar. Just so mm -hmm. many lives and things that I'm trying to remember what I'm doing here um yeah 11 o'clock oh sorry 11 o'clock is yoga with sherry so that's going to be super fun and then 12 o'clock is tennis elbow um lesson as well so i know some people complained about having that so that'll be great so uh oh and then lastly sorry two two o'clock i need to put this on the calendar but i booked uh um a lesson on like strings and rackets so that'll be really cool too for you tech uh tech heads so, but anyway, uh, Jorge, I know you've spent a lot of time with us today. And so thank you so much. And thank everybody for tuning in and, uh, we will see you next time. Thanks. All everyone. right, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.